and to push open a glass door, well, if it's a cold temperatures like you're going to see in New York and other states, well, that particle in its there in its liquid form can stay on that glass door for up to seven weeks. But the CDC is just going to run with the fact that Ebola is not a threat. You can't catch it on a bus, even if that person sneezes on the bus window. And in fact, they are so confident that America is so exceptional and that they can cure this Ebola outbreak. They're thinking about bringing in non-citizens to treat them. It needs to be recognized by the president and by you and others in the administration that when the president says that he's going to set a time limit and then consider taking actions himself, which many of us read to me, the president again repeating, I have a pen and a cell phone and if you don't act, I will, that that makes uh, doing immigration reform harder, not easier, because those who may like what the president decides to do administratively have less reason to negotiate the hard decisions to be made about how to enforce our immigration laws in the future. And those uh, who do not agree with the president's position on immigration reform say, why should we negotiate if we can't trust the president to enforce the laws as they exist? House Representative Bob Goodlot has received information from inside President Barack Obama's administration detailing plans to ship non-U.S. citizens with Ebola into the United States to receive treatment. Uh, if you are concerned about this problem spreading, and this is a deadly disease that we're even concerned about the great health care workers when they come back not spreading it, we certainly shouldn't be bringing in the patients. Goodlatte, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, wrote a letter to Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson. I love this country. I care about the safety of our people. I believe in public service, and I remain loyal to you, Mr. President. And Secretary of State John Kerry requesting any information on the plans. But those requests have gone unanswered. The White House also denied Goodlatte's request to impose a temporary ban on non-U.S. citizens traveling to the United States from the three African countries hardest hit by Ebola. Don't panic. The news hit this morning. A Texas nurse who treated an infected patient tested positive for Ebola. And in California, a sick passenger on a flight from JFK to Los Angeles triggered an Ebola scare. In Boston, a man is in isolation at the hospital after complaining of Ebola-like symptoms. That common sense request was not only denied, President Obama claims it won't make a difference. If we institute a travel ban instead of the protocols that we put in place now, uh, history shows that there is a likelihood of increased uh, avoidance. And as a consequence, we could end up having more cases rather than less. The Obama administration has already illustrated their preference to dangerously instigate an unyielding socialist position over the safety of American citizens. In 2013, Immigration and Customs Enforcement released into the United States 2,200 illegals, 629 of which that have criminal records ranging from repeated drunk driving offenses to aggravated felony, drug, sexual abuse, and homicide charges. No one on that list was uh, charged or convicted with murder, rape, or sexual abuse of a minor, were they? They were not. Uh, was anyone charged or convicted of illicit trafficking in a controlled substance? Um, there were some with uh, drug offenses. The individual I mentioned earlier who is 68 and a lawful permanent resident. Were any involved in uh, child pornography? Uh, not of the ones that I am aware of the release, no. Were, so of the 2,228, you can testify that none of them were involved in child pornography? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I can testify the answer is, is no. Well, to the best of your knowledge just means that you don't have any knowledge of it. That information was leaked to the public only after USA Today made a Freedom of Information Act request, although 418 charges of child sexual molestation and rape in North Carolina in one month alone went heavily unreported. As Obama waits until after the midterm elections to open the floodgates, what is driving the Obama administration's recklessness? Look no further than senior advisor to President Barack Obama, John P. Holdren. Holdren is the author of EcoScience, the textbook that advocates putting drugs in the water supply to sterilize people, mandatory forced abortions, and a tyrannical eco-fascist dictatorship run by a planetary regime. Holdren's radical solutions to overpopulation are routinely discussed in the halls of the National Academy of Sciences.
The National Academy of Sciences has published a shocking report which envisages a Chinese-style global one-child policy as the only means of reversing climate change and reducing global population to a sustainable number of 1 to 2 billion people. The white paper entitled Human Population Reduction is Not a Quick Fix for Environmental Problems, authored by the University of Adelaide's Corey Bradshaw and Barry Brook, even entertains the impact of world wars and global pandemics that wipe out 6 billion people as potential methods of combating the threat posed to the environment by overpopulation. Under one scenario, a global pandemic wipes out 6 billion people from the year 2041 onwards, resulting in the planet's population being reduced to 5.1 billion by the year 2100. However, this reduction of 2 billion people compared to current figures is not sufficient to accomplish the level of human culling desired by the authors, who note that even future events that rival or plausibly exceed past societal cataclysms cannot guarantee small future population sizes without additional measures such as fertility control. The paper is edited by Stanford University's Paul R. Ehrlich a perennial advocate of population reduction whose dire proclamations about environmental catastrophes as a result of overpopulation have been proven wildly inaccurate time and time again. This will confuse you because how can then the total population grow like this if the children doesn't increase? Where will all these adults come from? John Bound for Infowars.com. DNA force. When cells become toxic, they die early and aging sets in. DNA force. No one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. Just one of the key compounds, BioPQQ, is backed by major clinical studies. DNA force. We now have the synergistic solution. Secure your DNA force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll free 888 253 3139. DNA force. The globalist social engineers are not just targeting us with propaganda. They are manipulating our genetics. We are being targeted at every level by estrogen mimickers that lower our testosterone and other hormones and natural compounds that the body needs. After consulting top doctors, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others, we have developed what I believe is the ultimate non-GMO organic super male vitality formula sourced from powerful organic herbs and then concentrated for maximum potency super male vitality was developed to activate your body's own natural processes instead of using synthetic chemicals super male vitality by infowars life is so powerful that i only take half the recommended dose for a limited time we are offering 15 percent off super male vitality at infowarslife.com to introduce you to this powerful supplement visit infowarslife.com today to secure your super male vitality infowarslife.com well, Google is honoring Dr. Salk today in honor of Dr. Salk's 100th birthday. He is the doctor who pioneered the first polio vaccine in 1954. And their doodle shows uh, kids holding up signs saying, thank you for the vaccines, Dr. Salk. Yay, thank you for the vaccines. Now, just a little history on this. Dr. Salk pioneered this first polio vaccine by performing a double-blind experiment on school children. Uh, the school children for their participation were given a suite and a polio pioneer certificate. The results were announced the following year and they said that the vaccine is safe and effective, which is what they're still using those buzzwords of safe and effective. And it is credited with completely eradicating polio in the U.S. by 1979. Yay, vaccines. Now, aside from the fact that some graphs show that infectious diseases were already on the decline prior to the advent of vaccines, let's just take a look at the dark history of these polio vaccines. Now, from 1953 to 1963, the Merck drug company vaccines had deliberately contaminated uh, SV40 virus was in their vaccines and they continued to give it out. Now, for years, researchers suggested that millions of vials of the polio vaccine that infected individuals that caused tumors, molecular evidence of these SV40 infections were showing up in children born after 1982 
And some experts now suggest that this virus might have remained in the polio vaccine up until 1999. Now, Dr. Maurice Hilleman, he, uh, he's a Merck scientist, he admits on tape that these vaccines were tainted with leukemia and other kinds of cancers, and they just gave it to the Russians. So I brought African greens, and I didn't know we were importing AIDS virus at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and and well, it was you who introduced AIDS virus to the country. No, that's right. But yellow fever vaccine had leukemia yeah. virus in it, and you know, this is in the days of very crude science. I just think this virus may have some long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And he said, "What?" I said, oh, "Cancer." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. And I love it. Go ahead. Yeah. The jokes that were going around was, gee, we would win the Olympics because uh, the Russians would all be loaded down with tumors. <laughs> this is where the vaccine was being tested. This was this was yeah, right. Now, at one time, the CDC's website admitted that they knew about this SV40 being in the polio vaccines. But, of course, that fact sheet that linked the polio vaccine to cancer was sent down the memory hole. Uh, the site scrubbed a page that admitted this, uh, the, the vaccine that was actually administered from 1955 to 1963 to over 98 million Americans, and that it was contaminated with SV40. Now, the pages, of course, are still available through Google's cache system, uh, but the vaccine was discovered to contain the monkey cancer virus SV40 in 1960, but the existing polio vaccine stocks were not recalled and were used until 1963, and the CDC admits that on that page. Now, this means that the CDC was, for a period, consciously dispersing these vaccines that were known to have a possible link to cancer, including to tens of millions of people in other countries, such as the UK, Australia, and the former Soviet Union. Now, a Loyola University scientist says that it was possible that the Soviet Union's polio vaccine was contaminated until the early 80s, and it was probably exported to China, Japan, and several countries in Africa, meaning hundreds of millions of people could have been exposed. So, of course, if this was knowingly administered for years after the fact, there's no telling what's in vaccines today. So would they even have a problem recalling a vaccine if they found out that it was contaminated with something? Now, we've reported in the past, rather than throw away their contaminated drugs, Bayer just gave their AIDS-infected drugs to Africa. And then, of course, it later came out that they did this. Now, a 2009 article from the Boston Globe, it was originally titled, Polio Surge in Nigeria After Vaccine Virus Mutates. Now, this was, obviously, if you go to that page now, it's been removed or deleted, of course. Uh, but it reported that polio was spreading in Nigeria, and health officials said in some cases that it's caused by the vaccine that's used to fight it. They say that experts have long believed epidemics that are unleashed by a vaccine's mutated virus wouldn't last since the vaccine only contains a weakened virus strain, but that assumption is coming under pressure. Some experts now say that once viruses from vaccines start circulating, they can become just as dangerous as wild viruses. The only difference is that this virus was originally in a vaccine vial. Now, this is exactly what we are seeing with other viruses. Of course, they're reporting a resurgence of whooping cough, enterovirus, measles, mumps, rubella. But of course, it's a little bit of a mutated version, and these versions are more virulent. But the industry wants to blame it on parents who aren't getting their children vaccinated, even though in some, if not most, of the cases of children that are coming down with these new mutated forms, they're kids who have been vaccinated for measles and mumps and rubella. So according to this graph, it shows that death rates from infectious diseases were already on the decline prior to the advent of vaccines. So what is the true reason for you know, them pushing this and uh, saying that vaccines are responsible for the decline? Well, from his book, Health and Healing, Dr. Andrew Weil best answers it with this statement. He says, Scientific medicine has taken credit that it does not deserve for some advances in health. Now, most people believe that victory over the infectious diseases of the last century came with the invention of immunizations. But in fact, they were in decline 
well before that these became available and the result of course is better methods of sanitation, sewage disposal, and distribution of food and water. But of course, the propaganda in favor